So we are starting back, if you were with us over the fall, you'll know that we're taking a year to work our way through the book of Acts. And we're, we're doing it in three different seasons. We're taking a couple breaks here and there, but we're splitting it up into three different sections that we're calling seasons. And we're splitting it up kind of along the design of the book. If you read Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says this, and this, you, you can think of it like a thesis statement for the, for the entire book. Jesus says to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then Luke, he goes about writing the book of Acts, and he seems to do it in these concentric circles. He first talks about what happens in Jerusalem, and then he talks about what happens in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And that's how we're splitting up our three different seasons. And today is the start of season two, where we're going to be looking at what what happens in all Judea and Samaria. And it's pretty exciting. Now, before we dive into the passage, I, I will say... Preaching out of Acts is interesting because it's, it's a story and it's compelling, but it's not very individualistic. And here's what I mean. I, it's, it's pretty easy to stand up and preach something that has immediate like personal pertinence, where it talks about either our inner life or how we individually apply ourselves to a specific thing. But the book of Acts invites us to think a little bit bigger to think about the identity and the mission of the people of God as a whole. And I think this is really important because the better you understand the mission as a whole, the better you understand the identity of the church as a whole, actually the more insight you have into your personal role within it. If we ignore the big picture, we'll actually get the smaller pictures wrong. Or to put it in some of the language of the, the Apostle Paul, if the church of Jesus Christ is a body and we are individually members of it, you can't really understand what a hand is for unless you understand what an entire body is for. So I would encourage you, lean into the book of Acts, into these bigger, broader thoughts, and think about them as opposed to saying, like, I don't see any immediate application of that to my life. I believe you will if we spend a little bit of time thinking about it. So you can go ahead and open up your Bible to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 1 through 25, Acts chapter 8, and we're about to see the good news about Jesus, the gospel, break out of Jerusalem and go into all Judea and Samaria, and it's pretty extraordinary. So that's Acts 8, verse 1 through 25, follow along in a Bible or a Bible app, the scripture will also be up on the screen, you're welcome to follow along there. I'm going to read for us, we'll pray, we'll dive in, and then we'll baptize some people. Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose in that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered about went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city." But there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him, because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women." Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing great signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them 
Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that, the, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of, of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this history of the early church that you have preserved for us. Lord, that, that we might meditate on what it means to be your people, what it means to be your church, what it means to be on mission, making disciples, preaching, proclaiming the good news about Jesus. Lord, would you inspire us with this passage today? In Jesus' name, amen. As I was thinking about the gospel breaking out of Jerusalem and now going to Judea and Samaria, I, I, I had this image that came to mind. So I'm a musician, and I love finding out the background of bands that I really enjoy. Maybe you enjoy doing the, the same thing. And it's really interesting. When bands get up and going, they'll have this initial spark. Maybe they have an album that kind of gets traction, and people really enjoy it, and people are sharing the songs and say, hey, have you heard? Have you heard? But there's a moment when the rubber really hits the road, literally, actually, and it kind of determines whether or not they're going to have longevity or whether they're just going to be a flash in the pan. And it's when they hit the road, like when they go on tour, and they take their music out of their closet or out of their bedroom, and now they and their band are going to go and like take it into live venues and perform it in front of people. And that is the point at which bands, that there's something there, there's a spark there, there's some kind of lightning in a bottle, they usually see it and then they gain traction and they have a gathering and people start to become fans and that's usually how big bands get their start. Then there are some people that there isn't something there. And it's something that you discover about bands when it goes on the road. And that's what I thought about when it came to the gospel. What's going to happen when the gospel now breaks out of Jerusalem? And goes on the road. Because the gospel is pretty anchored in the story of the Jewish people. It's couched in, in their history. What's going to happen when it goes to people who don't have that shared history or who don't necessarily understand that? And what happens is pretty extraordinary. It is really, really extraordinary. And we're, we're going to see three things. That when the gospel goes on the road, it overcomes... It exposes and it transforms. When the gospel goes on the road, it overcomes, it exposes, and it transforms. So first, it overcomes. The chapter we read doesn't start out very well, does it? And maybe if you re remember the very end of season one, the, the martyrdom of Stephen, the murder of Stephen, is how chapter seven ends. And then we're told that there arose a great persecution against, against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Hyperlink to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Not only that, but Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, taking people to prison. But in verse 4, it says this, Now those who were scattered went about, what it doesn't say is hiding in caves, or went about, keeping their mouths closed, went about skulking in the shadows. What does it say? Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. When the gospel goes on the road, the first thing we see is that it overcomes persecution. Now, we don't quite get this from the English translation, but 
the first phrase in verse 4 is translated here now. Now those who were scattered went about. Some other English translations get this a little bit better. It's this Greek phrase, men un, or un, un men. Which, which, which one is it? Men, men un. And it's this double phrase that actually links the two verses together. I think an English phrase that gets the point across is, however, therefore. However, therefore. Luke wants us to see that in light of what's going on, the church being persecuted, the church experiencing opposition, being pressured, people being arrested. However, therefore, the people went about proclaiming the word, went about preaching. Persecution has this opposite effect on the church, the pressure and the opposition. It doesn't tamp them down. It doesn't quiet them. If anything, it's the very catalytic thing that sends them into the surrounding regions. Pretty extraordinary, the power of the gospel to do that. I, um, there's this counterintuitive thing that happens when you experience opposition to preaching the gospel. I'm, I'm part of this master's cohort. Um, some of you last week, if you were here, you saw the the video for Every Nation Seminary, and I was in it, so, yeah. <laughs> then you all made awkward sounds, like, ooh, ah. <laughs> Anyways, that's not the point. The point is, I'm part of this global co- cohort of pastors of Every Nation churches who are going through this seminary program together, and some of them are in places where their lives are quite literally at risk every day. Pastors in nations that I can't mention, because this is going to go on the internet, who when we're praying together on Zoom, talk about like, yeah, pray for us. We've got two of our congregation in prison and the jury is out. They might be executed. They might not. But it's wild. These very people who experience the most opposition are the most unashamedly passionate and vocal about the gospel. What, what is that? Well, it's something in the nature of the gospel itself. <laughs> that opposition doesn't tamp it down. It catalyzes it. When the gospel goes on the road, it overcomes. So first, it it overcomes opposition. But then it overcomes something else. So we're told in verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, if you were a first century Jewish person and you heard about this or you read this, your jaw would hit the floor. Because Jews don't go to Samaria. Jews don't go to Samaria. Maybe... You're familiar with this from the story at the woman at the well. It was not the case simply that they were racist or that the two ethnicities didn't like each other. There was 900 years of bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans. David's grandson, Rehoboam, he was supposed to be king over the entire nation of Israel, but he treated the northern tribes really, really poorly. This is like 900 years prior to this moment. And 10 of the northern tribes say, well, forget you, we're, we're not going to deal with you. And there was a split between the nation of Israel, where you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And if this wasn't bad enough, immediately the first king of the northern kingdom led the people into idol worship. He said, I don't want the people going down to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, which, by the way, they were supposed to, according to the Mosaic Covenant. So he had an idea. He said, I'm going to set up altars in the northernmost part of the northern kingdom and the southernmost part of the northern kingdom. And what did he set up? Two golden calves. Now, what does that make you think of? Egypt, uh, the Exodus, right? When the people of Israel came came out of the, the nation of Egypt and they went to Sinai, Aaron set them up golden calves. It was this terrible moment. So if you're a Jewish person who grew up around Jerusalem, When you hear of Samaritans, you immediately think, oh yeah, 900 years ago, those pagan idol worshipers, those apostate heretics. Now, if that weren't bad enough, as time went on, 200 years after this split, God judged the northern kingdom and they went into exile in um, Assyria. And the Assyrians brought in foreign peoples from all the surrounding parts of the empire and they resettled them in the land of Judah. Excuse me in the northern kingdom, in in Samaria. And the remnant of the Jews who were still there, we're told, intermarried with these foreign peoples. And they started worshiping not only Yahweh, not only the one true God, but alongside all this idol worship. 
It's made really, really clear in the chronicles of Israel's history. So if you are a Jew thinking about the Samaritans, what are you thinking? Oh yeah, if it wasn't bad enough under the Israelite kings, then when you got resettled, then there was this mixed worship. Not only that, but in the, inter- in the intertestamental period, after, after the scriptures were finished, before when Jesus came, there was outright conflict and hostility between these people. Wars were waged across these borders. In the year 128, a Jewish king rose up and he destroyed the temple at Mount Gerizim. Now this was their holy site. This was where they went to worship and it got destroyed. A century later, Samaritans allegedly brought human bones to the temple in Jerusalem in order to desecrate it. So this is the tension. This is the hostility. This is their attitude towards one another. And it was always this question, like, 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 I mean, the Samaritans used a modified form of, of the books of Moses and rejected the rest of the Jewish scriptures. So if you are a person who grew up Jewish, you have one very clear picture of the Samaritans, and it's heretic, apostate, untouchable. And yet, what does Philip do? Philip went down to the city of Samaria. I love the faith of this man. I just, (laughs) Philip sitting under the apostles' teaching, he's one of the seven, if you remember, he has an entire childhood of growing up viewing the Samaritans a certain way, that they've rejected the writings, they've rejected the scriptures, they've, they've messed with the worship of Yahweh, they've set up a competing temple, they've done everything wrong. And when he gets scattered out of Jerusalem because of the persecution, he's like, You know where I'm going? Samaria. I love this guy. And it's something about the nature of the gospel itself. Something that God did when he poured out his spirit. And Jesus said to them, you are going to be my witnesses. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. Like I'm convinced Jesus had to mention Samaria because he knew his disciples would be like, yeah, we'll go to all the nations of the world. Not Samaria. He's like, no, all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The hostility, we, we, we can scarcely fathom the intensity of the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans, but Philip says, that's where I'm going. What was true of this region back then is true of our world today. There are relational divides, ethnic divides, socioeconomic divides. There are groups of people who want nothing to do with other groups of people. And we hear about all these solutions proposed and there there are elements of truth and goodness in those. But the thing that can cross these divides is the gospel. When the gospel goes on the road. When those who are scattered take this good news of Jesus with them. When the good news goes on the road, it overcomes opposition and it overcomes antagonism. Second, when the gospel goes on the road, it exposes It exposes. Now we encounter the weird story of the magician Simon. His story is a bit strange. And I've been thinking about his story a lot. And it's it's just, it's really, really interesting and nuanced. So we're told a few things about Simon. We're told that he's a magician. He hangs out in Samaria and he's been impressing people for a lot of time. But Philip comes into town, starts preaching the gospel. And Simon actually repents and believes in the gospel. He gets baptized, and we're told he continues with Philip. So this maybe means he in some way, shape, or form was like a traveling companion as Philip was going around Samaria preaching the gospel, but he's as part of the inner circle now. Great? Not quite. Peter and John come up to Samaria. They lay their hands on the Samaritans. The Holy Spirit falls upon them, which we'll get to that in a second. But then Simon does this really weird thing where he offers them money so that he might be able to lay his hands on people and they would receive the Holy Spirit. Now we read that and we're like, "Uh, that's weird. (laughs) What's going on? Well, Peter discerns what's going on. And here's what he says. Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You don't have any part of this because your heart is not right before God. So even though Simon has 
believed the gospel in some way, shape, or form, even though he's been baptized, even though he's continuing with Philip, there's something going on in his heart that is not right. Well, what is it? Peter continues, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness and pray that if possible, the Lord may forgive the intent of your heart. For I see, and then he uses this phrase, I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. Now, I didn't know, I have no idea what that meant. Had to do a bunch of study to try and figure out what that meant. And it links to a phrase that's used in Deuteronomy. It basically means your heart, the the roots of your heart are rotten. Like rotten roots, rotten fruit. So Peter is just using an image here to get across to Simon. There is something wrong with your heart. Your heart is rotten. And there's no way that a rotten root produces rotten fruit. So here's the, here's the question. What is wrong with Simon's heart? That's a really important question. Luke devoted like, you know, a third of a page of the book of Acts to Simon's story. We're meant to understand what's going on. So after much thinking, here's my proposal. There's debate about what's going on with Simon. Here's what I'm convinced by. Look up in verse 9. There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic and amazed people, saying that he himself was someone great. This is our first introduction to Simon. Saying that he himself was someone great. Okay? Philip comes into town, and what are we told? Attention starts to turn away from Simon and towards Philip. So, Simon continues, and he believes, ish, and yet, there's something not right in his heart, but I think the moment that is the telltale sign is the moment after which he offers them money. So, the apostles lay their hands on the Samaritans, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and in this extraordinary moment, I mean, what happened in Acts chapter 2 is now happening for the Samaritans. Just unbelievable. God is pouring out his spirit on Samaritans. Extraordinary. What is Simon focused on? He isn't looking at the Samaritans who are receiving the Holy Spirit. He's looking at the apostles. He's thinking, whoa, imagine being able to do that. His eyes are in the wrong place. He's not thinking, wow, look, the Holy Spirit is falling upon them. He's thinking, man, these apostles must have a lot of Instagram followers. How do I get that? And so he offers them money. What's not right in Simon's heart? Simon is more about fame and notoriety than he is about the true gift of God, which is what? The presence of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's what Peter says. You thought you could buy the gift of God with money? You have no part and no lot in this. And I love this part because it actually shows the great problem in every human heart. The great problem in every human heart is that we have worshipped and served things other than God. We have treated things, created things like God, and we have given them our devotion and our worship that should have gone to God. And in this merciful moment, God sends Peter and John. I mean, Philip didn't even recognize it. God sends Philip and John to give Simon an opportunity to repent of the thing in his heart that has been exposed. When the gospel shows up in town, it starts exposing what's, what's in people's hearts. And maybe you've found this. Maybe you've started speaking to a friend about the good news about Jesus and things just start to go haywire. Stuff starts to come out of, come out of this per- person's life and your life. It brings what's in the heart to the surface so that in the hope that people can deal with it, repent of it, and actually be about the main thing, which is the presence of God, having relationship with God, to receive the true gift of God. When the gospel goes on the road, it exposes. Third, when the gospel goes on the road, it transforms. Uh, just the before and after picture of Samaria here is wonderful. It transforms. What, is, what does it do? Well, it brings freedom to people who were captive. So Philip went down to Samaria. Everyone was paying attention to him. This is in verse 6. When they heard him and saw the signs that he was doing, four unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. God is freeing people who are oppressed by demons. This is awesome. They came out of them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. 
There's freedom. And then I love this, like, if you're wondering what verse to memorize this week, Acts 8, verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. I love that. There was much joy in that city. I, this is my prayer over our city. This is my prayer over our city because there's a lack of joy in our city. I, um, when I talk to people about Jesus, I like to camp out on the subject of meaning and purpose. And a question that I'll ask is, you know, to people who say they don't believe in God, I ask, do you think there's any greater meaning or purpose in the universe? And so many people say to me, no. And my heart just breaks. It breaks. For, for a, you know, if, if we're on campus and talking to students, for a a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old to say, you know what, I don't think there's any greater meaning or purpose to life. Just what I can cobble together. Oh, that breaks my heart. And my prayer is that as the gospel continues to show up in our city, to go on the road to our different neighborhoods, to spread here, to spread throughout New England, is that what was true of the city in Samaria becomes true of our city. There was much joy in that city. Reconciliation. We're told in John chapter 4, Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. It actually says that in John. Here, what's happening? Jews are going up from Jerusalem to Samaria. They're leaving their comfort zone, their familiarity, and they're going up and not just associating with laying their hands on Samaritans. Do you know what some of their non-believing you know, cousins and brothers and sisters would have said, you are defiling yourself. You are no longer allowed at the temple. How dare you touch a Samaritan? What are, what are they doing? They say, this is God's project. His project is for, for the nations. Yeah, we're going to lay hands on them. Reconciliation. 900 years of bad blood dealt with because of the gospel. We see expansion. The last verse we read, verse 25 Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, but they didn't just like get going quick. What does it say? Preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. What New Testament scholar Craig Keener points out, he says, Philip, being a a Hellenistic Jew, probably spoke Greek, but not Aramaic. But Peter and John probably spoke Aramaic. So in this city center, Philip could preach because they probably all spoke Greek, but in the villages, they likely spoke Aramaic. And so what do Peter and John do? They're like, well, let's not take the fast way home. Let's take our time. Let's go preach to more of these villages and see what God might do. When the gospel goes on the road, it brings transformation. Transformation. So how do we apply this to our lives? This is... I. <laughs> The the book of Acts is really interesting because it's all a story, right? And it's the story of a people who have taken Jesus at his command to go make disciples of all nations. And I think we're meant to be inspired by this story. Because it's one thing to hear Jesus say, go make disciples of all nations, and to stand up here every week and somebody tells you, we exist to make disciples, But it's another thing to look at a story of what happens when that very gospel goes on the road and rolls up into town. And I think we're meant to be inspired. And I I want you to see three things that can really inspire us. First, I want you to see the aim of going. We should see the aim of going in this passage. It says in verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. What is the aim of going? Telling people about Jesus. It's quite simple, really. It's getting the good news of Jesus in front of people's faces so that they can hear it. This word um, where it says preaching the word, verse 4, is the Greek word euangelizo. It's where we get our words evangelism from. And I know evangelism, that word scares some people. Like, oh, it's the E word, please no. But it's quite simple. It's telling people the good news about Jesus. We should see the aim of going. Second, we should see the readiness of the Spirit. I love this one. The readiness of the Spirit. Philip, he says, I know there's 900 years of bad blood. I'm going to go. 
and I'm going to see what God's going to do. And boy, oh boy, does God do stuff. He shows up, he starts preaching. Paralytics start getting up, up off the ground. Pretty amazing. People who have demonic oppression start getting freed. These Samaritans who should run him out of town are not paying attention to what he's saying. Why? Not because Philip has any specific power. No, because of Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in all Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Lo and behold, the Spirit shows up and does what Jesus has promised he will do. The readiness of the Spirit. Third, we see the benefit of gospel partners. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it, says, it says that um, in verse, whatever this is, 1, it says, except the apostles. It says that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. We don't know if this is like good or bad on them. I mean, Jesus did tell them specifically, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria. But it seems like Philip had to kind of get them out of their comfort zone. <laughs> Philip goes first. He has the faith. He's like, well, I'm out. All right, Samaria, let, let's go. And then the church hears about what's going on. Like, oh, Peter, John, get up there. Check it out, you know? I love how Philip's faith catalyzes the faith of Peter and John. Because what do Peter and John do? They start to leave Samaria and they're like, ah, let's go the long way home and preach the gospel here. Let's do a Philip in these surrounding regions. Faith, the faith of Philip sparks and catalyzes the faith of Peter and John. But also notice how the discernment of Peter protects Philip. Philip didn't realize that there was something going on. At least we don't see that he re realized that there was something going on in Simon. This guy who was on the inside, who was actually in it for the fame and the notoriety. It took Peter coming up to town and saying like, hmm, something not right in this man's heart. I love the protection that comes from this team ministry. And here's, we talked about being part of a group earlier. Yeah, this is a space to study the Bible, to pray, for one or, to pray for one another. It's also a space in which you get equipped so that you together can take the gospel into your different spheres. And you're like, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, great. People in your small group probably do. We have classes here at the church that are designed to equip you in order to do it. But it comes down to a willingness to go. And God has given you what you need to go. And I believe that the greatest, the greatest reason we have to go with the gospel for God is what God himself has done to bring the gospel to us. Philip didn't go to Samaria because he thought this will be easy. Quite the opposite. Philip went to Samaria because he served a living God named Jesus Christ, who didn't just cross ethnic boundaries, who crossed the boundary between heaven and earth in order to come and bring reconciliation by the death of himself. Philip might well have been killed in Samaria. Jews were killed aplenty by Samaritans and vice versa. Why does Philip still go? Because he serves the risen Jesus. He says, if Jesus did that for me, I'm going to do that for him. And now the author of Hebrews says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who stepped out in faith and brought the gospel on the road to their cities. And now they're watching because they, their time has passed and now it's our time. And they're watching and they're praying for us. Will we take the challenge? Will we go? Will we fix our eyes on Jesus who stepped out of heaven for us that we might be saved? And if we think of the potential, what God does in Samaria, imagine what he might do in our city. Imagine what he might do in our region. The same thing that was true of back then is true of us today in our city, in our nation, in our world. There are divides that nothing else but the gospel can cross. And he sent us. Let's fix our eyes in Christ and go with him. And we're going to baptize people this morning. And I love how... <laughs> Yeah, worship team, you can, you can start to come on up. Um, I love, 
I love how what we're going to do this morning links to what we're looking at in the book of Acts. Because nothing on paper says that the salvation that we're going to be celebrating this morning should be possible. Unregenerate lives, lives held bondage by sin, lives in slavery to idolatry like Simon, hearts like Simon's, shouldn't be able to be made new. And yet what we're celebrating this morning is the very evidence that it is possible because of the good news about Jesus. And as we celebrate with people this morning, we are celebrating something that isn't possible in our own right, but is only possible because of God. That is nothing short of His power rushing into people's lives and making rotten hearts new, making broken lives healed, bringing bringing slaves to sin into freedom. That's what this represents. Maybe you've Maybe you've been to a baptism before. Maybe you haven't. Here's what baptism is all about. Briefly put, when people go down into the water, it, is, it signifies their association with the death of Jesus. That in the same way that Jesus went to die, our old selves are crucified with him. And along with that death, the shame and the brokenness And the things that used to characterize our lives and our past go down into the grave with him and they lose their power over us. But when they come, when these people come up out of the water, it represents what happened to Jesus Christ, that he was raised to new life. That he didn't stay dead in the grave, but on the third day, he came back to life. And now we who put our faith in Jesus come into new life. We are raised again new, fresh, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to celebrate with these people. I invite you to stand. Uh, The kids ministry is going to come back in. And I invite those who are being baptized up onto stage. They're, They're going to tell you a little bit of why they're being baptized today. Tech team, if I could get the microphone up here.